Well, good evening. How many of you thought we were starting at 615? Yeah. Yeah. And some of you that thought we were starting at 615 still didn't get here until closer to 630, right? So, no, I tell you what, when we did our last family conversation, uh, I was just watching people try to get in the door, and a lot of people, it's just 615 pushes a lot of people. So even though it says 615, we're probably going to start closer to 630, and uh, that way you have to listen to me a little less, and that'll be good for you. And so just know we'll start about 630, but, uh, and, and some other things I want you to know about this too. This, this is, if you're, just in case you're in the wrong room, this is our five-part series on how to piece together a full life, okay? First of all, don't be threatened by the title because sometimes when I hear stuff about how to have a full life, what I hear is, let's see how much more stuff we can cram in, right? And I'm already busy now. So we're not here to cram more stuff into your life. So that's the first thing I want you to know. We're gonna start around 6.30. Uh, that's the other thing I want you to know. Uh, let's see, what, oh, what else do I need you to know about this? Oh, okay. This time around, we're going to record all these sessions, but they're not going to be online for a while. So if you know somebody who's saying, I'm just going to hang out because it'll be online in the next few days, it won't be online for the next few days. So, so if you know somebody that's waiting for it, you need to snag them and say, come with me and, and get them in the room because I'm not sure exactly when it will go online in entirety. So I wanted you to know that also. Um, what else do I need you to know before we get started? Last thing I need you to know. If you are like me and in your older years, okay, you know, I, and, and the title, How to Piece Together a Full Life, may seem like it's too late for you, right? It's not. There's nothing in this class that won't fit young, old, or somewhere in the middle. Because here's my theory. If you're still alive and breathing, God still expects you to have a full life. You know? Just, it may look different than somebody else's, but if you're alive and breathing, God expects you to have a full life. So this is for ages across the board. So let me pray, and then we'll start. All right? Father, I'm grateful for this evening. I'm grateful for this opportunity. There are so many places in our world that this would be illegal. Not just illegal, it would be life-threatening. There are so many places around our world where, where believers are persecuted and uh, have to hide and have to do things underground. And we forget how blessed we are that we can just gather together. And so I'm grateful, grateful for this time. I'm grateful for everything that's going on around this campus, from preschoolers to teenagers to middle schoolers to children to adults, everything that's going on around here. May it bring you honor and glory. May you help us this evening in this room get what we need to get. And be different for everyone at the, every table, but help us to get what we need to get out of this evening. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, one more thing I want you to know. I do not want this to be stuffy and boring. So talk back to me if you've got questions, if you disagree with something, if you want to heckle. I'm used to that too. So just, just loosen up your ties and let's get after this, all right? Since this is a class on how to live a full life, I mean, and this class is about life, right? So I thought we would start by hearing what some people have had to say about life. I think you might find something out of this. I love this quote. Life is like a taxi. The meter just keeps a ticking, whether you're going somewhere or standing still. Isn't that a great quote? You have the same amount of time, whatever that is. We do not know what's determined for you, but you have the same amount of time and whether you're going anywhere or whether you're just standing still. So remind that, let that remind you that life is always ticking. I never thought it was, but I am soon to be 63. And uh, for some of you, that's ancient. For some of you, that's young. 
But time ticks differently at this age than it did when I was 36. So remember the, the taxi meter is still running. I like this quote. Life is like a hot bath. Feels good for a while when you're in it, but the longer you stay, the more wrinkles you get. <laughs> yes, I can attest to that. Some of us have been in life for a long time, too. We've been soaking in that tub. This is a person who was having a tough day. Life is like a cement, cement trampoline. <laughs> Anybody relate to that? Life is like a cement trampoline? I get that. I get that. That's a guy that was having a tough day. I like this one. Life is like a grindstone. Whether it grinds us down or polishes us up depends upon us. It really does. I mean, that's a, that's a key thing that we're going to be looking at throughout this whole series. Of course, we could not pass up this quote from Forrest Gump. Yeah. How many of you have been guilty of biting into one of those and found out it was something you didn't like and putting it back in the box? Oh, not back in the box, right? Okay. Yeah. You know, with those things, you have to take a little nibble out of the bottom. That's how that works. Because if you don't like it, you put it back down, then they can't tell. I learned that from my children. <laughs> and then this one. This is my quote. Some of you have heard me say this before. Life is like a game of cards. You may not be able to control the cards that you're dealt, but you can control how you play them. Any of you watch any professional poker tournaments on TV? They are as good as the best sleeping medicine ever. I mean, it's real. Those are, for me anyway, those are like snooze boring. But those people make tons of money. They make a lot of money. And they, the ones that make a lot of money, you know they don't make a lot of money because they get a good hand every time. They make a lot of money because they know how to play the bad hands well. Life is like that. A key skill in life is learning how to play the bad hands well. So, we're going to be talking about life this evening. Life. And we're all looking for a good life, right? I mean, I haven't heard anybody that comes, comes into my counseling office and says, you know, life is just too good. I really need a more rotten life. No one says that. We're all looking for the good life. So, tell me, for you, what's the good life? This is audience participation, so. What's the good life? Pardon? Having good health. Having good health. Someone else? Um, somebody to talk to. Pardon? Somebody to, somebody to talk to. The good life is having somebody to talk to. So this person said, you don't have to have good health to be happy. So translate that into what is a good life. Okay, we'll come back to you. Somebody else. I saw a hand somewhere. Okay, speak up really loud because I'm just this side of death. Peace within yourself. Peace with your family, friends. What? Yeah, and it's hard to have peace with all those people. Yeah. You're like, you, you get a percentage of them sometimes, and sometimes you just can't get, what's our pastor say? You can't make everybody happy, but you can make everybody mad. You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, but peace with people. Someone else? The good? Okay, you got the answer now. Family. Okay, so the good life is having a loving, caring family. Okay, someone else? Contentment. Pardon? Contentment. I'm sorry, I can't hear for the mask. Contentment. Contentment, thank you, thank you. You know, I, I told my wife just yesterday, darling, 
I'm going to have to go look at hearing aids. And she said, it's about time. You know, and, and what I'm finding is COVID has taught me how bad my hearing is because I didn't realize I watched people's mouths as much as I did and picked up on things. And, and when you put the mask on, it's like, it's like somebody turned off the lights and I can't see anything anymore. Contentment. That's a good definition. Full life. Good life. Somebody. Having the Lord. Having the Lord. Right. Make the best of every situation. Yes. Being a reflection of the Lord. Well, we are in church, aren't we? <laughs> okay. The winning lottery ticket. There we go. Now we're getting down to it right now. You know. You know, it's like that old story that that you know. It's been told for years, kids in Sunday school class, and the teacher says, they're, they're drawing pictures of animals, and the teacher says, what's, what's small and brown and has a bushy tail? And the kid goes, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but since we're in church, I know it's got to be Jesus, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's really easy to fall into that, and, and it's nothing against Jesus, mind you, but, uh, but we typically think a different way in here than we do out there sometimes. Anybody else want to chime in on what the good life is? Yes. So feeling like you're making a difference in the world. Feel like you're making a difference. Feeling like you're making a difference. We talked about that in the last family conversations when we talked about meaning. All right, anyone else? This is your chance. Yes. And being able to go outside and look at the moon and think how beautiful it is. Go outside and look at the moon or any creation and think how beautiful it is. Was there someone else? Yes. Being happy in spite of or regard, irregardless of your circumstances. Those are all really good ones. Now, here's what I, I want you to realize, that we all have definitions of what a good life is. And other than a couple of the, the God answers we got, the, the problem is with most of our definitions of what a good life is, if you took that stuff away, then technically we don't have a good life. And, and so if my definition of a good life is health, and then my health goes south, then can I not have a good life? If my definition is, is having peace with my family, but my family's like the Hatfields and McCoys, does that mean I can't have a good life? Uh, and so we need to figure out, because we all want the good life, we all have definitions of what it might be, but we all still search for it because those definitions often get rocked in this world. And another reason why we need to talk about this is because this was important to Jesus. You know, this was an important topic for Jesus. Look at this passage of Scripture. Jesus said these words. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is talking about the full life. And so if Jesus was interested in us having a full life, an abundant life, then we need to figure out what that is. Because obviously he wants it for us. And notice there's no age qualifiers on there or anything. I want you to zero in on three key words in that passage. Three key words. The first word is have. Have. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit, when I'm doing Bible study, I'm a bit of a word nerd. And... Uh, so I dug up this word have in the original language. In the original language, that word have is present tense. Oh, I got, I'm going to interrupt you for a commercial for just a minute because if I don't, I'll be in trouble with my assistant. My assistant said to remind everyone at the table, sign in at the table. And uh, make sure you sign in. Helps us get a good count. Uh, give us your email once. We won't ask for it all the time, but that way if there's something comes up in Clement Weather or something, we can email you. But please do that. So, boy, I just threw myself off track. Now, where was I? The word have. The original language. The word have. Yes. In the original language, the word have, when Jesus said, I have come that you might have 
life and have it more abundantly. The word have is present tense. So what that means is he's not talking about you having life way out there somewhere. You know, that eventually when you retire, you'll have a full life. Or eventually when you go to heaven, you'll have a full life. It's present tense. He's talking about fullness of life here and now. And since we all know that our circumstances are varied at any moment here and now, that means the life he must be talking about is independent of our circumstances. So my here and now may be great. Your here and now may be south of heaven somewhere. But the issue is Jesus wants us to have a full life now. We know that full life is waiting for us in heaven as believers. We don't have to worry about that. He wants to have a full life now. It's present tense. Also, it's a personal word in the original language. It's personal. In other words, it's not a general word. It's I want you specifically to have a full life now. I want you specifically. It's a word to me. It's a word to you. It's not a word to us. It's a word to us individually. And then that word have is an active word. It's an active word. It's, here's what that means. And I was not really good in language arts in school, so I had to look this stuff up. But the active tense means that it's happening. It, it, let me put it this way. The active tense means that it's not something you possess. It's something you do. It's something you live. I've come that you might have life. Not just possess it like a possession, but actually live it, be engaged in it. Do it. So that's just the first word, the word have. Look at the next word, life. The word is life. Now, in the original language, this word refers not to our spiritual life. It refers to our natural life, the life we live on this earth. It's not a spiritual word. It's really easy when we read that to spiritualize things, to say, well, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, so he wants us all to have eternal life. And he does, but that's not the point of this passage. That's not the point of this passage at all. He wants us to have life in this world that is full, that's meaningful, that's abundant. And he wants it to be life. Do you realize that there's a difference between life and existence? There's a lot of people that exist, but they're not really living. I'm so fearful of being one of those people that exist, but they're not really living. I love this quote by E.E. E. Cummings. E.E. E. Cummings was a poet. He did everything in small, lowercase. Grammar was not that big a deal to E.E. E. Cummings. But listen to this quote. Unbeing dead isn't being alive. You know, and as I typed this out, my computer kept going, that's not right, capitalize this, do that. No, this is how he wrote it. Unbeing dead isn't being alive. So, that's the second word. So, I came that you might have life, you personally, in this world right now, and that you might not just possess it, you actually live it out. And I've come that you might have life here, not just way out there. Here's the third word, abundantly, and that you might have it abundantly. Now, some people, when they hear this word, we automatically think more stuff, Fuller garage, fuller attic, beach house. I mean, we think more stuff when we think about abundantly. But life is not stuff. Some of you, like me, have lots of stuff. But you know deep down in your heart that's not life. Look at this passage of Scripture. Jesus said it. And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life, there's the word, does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I've known people who have very little in life, but they have a lot of life. I've known people who have a lot in life who have very little life. So abundantly doesn't mean stuff. Uh, Steve Jobs. I'm, I'm a big Steve Jobs fan. I'm not saying he's the absolute model you should follow, but I've I've been very interested in his life throughout his career and after his passing. And uh, 
Steve Jobs was a millionaire at 21. Okay? He was a multimillionaire at 25. At 30, he was worth $2 billion. And before he died, he was worth $8.3 billion. And he had a $46 million jet. But all accounts that I read say that he was hard to work with. He was never satisfied. And he threw his life away when he had an illness that could have been treated because he was convinced that he couldn't trust doctors. He had lots of stuff. But I'm not sure he had a lot of life. Another passage from Jesus. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So all of this is to say that abundant, the word abundantly does not necessarily mean more stuff. Came across this quote. This fascinated me. This is quote is from Jim Carrey. You know Jim Carrey, The Mask, all these movies he's been in, Stuart uh, Truman Show. Watch this. I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. There's someone who's been there and bought the shirt, knows what he's talking about. So all of this is to say that abundantly doesn't mean stuff. Jesus owned nothing but the clothes on his back. So we know that when he says he wants to give us an abundant life, it doesn't have to do with more stuff. Which is very freeing because some of us don't have a lot of stuff. And if it takes a lot of stuff to have the abundant life, I'm going to miss out. But it's very freeing to know that me having an abundant life, having a full life, is not dependent upon my stuff. In case you haven't figured it out, tonight we are just laying the groundwork. I just want to lay the groundwork tonight on this idea of a full life. And then we'll get into it in detail starting next week. So, here's the deal. Let's look at this. Let's look at the puzzle of life. Because it is puzzling. Life is puzzling. How many of you like to do jigsaw puzzles? Show of hands. Okay, we have some people out here. I'm a jigsaw puzzle freak. I'm a fanatic about it. Uh, my mom did that to me. She always had a jigsaw puzzle going on a card table when I was growing up, and I was just, it was like a magnet to me. And once I started, I couldn't stop. When I was in seminary, I had, it was finals week, and I was behind. So I'm cramming for finals. I got tests the next morning. And what did my family do? They got out a jigsaw puzzle that night. I am not lying to you. At 4.30 in the morning, I was still working on the jigsaw puzzle. Hadn't studied, hadn't done anything. I was just hooked. So, yeah, I'm kind of a jigsaw puzzle fan. Fortunately, now I can pull them up on my iPad, do a 400 piece on my iPad. It's a lot easier that way. But life is like that. Life is like the jigsaw puzzle. We want to put the pieces together right. We want to accomplish it. We want to see the final goal. Now, you tell me, you that work jigsaw puzzles, what are some of the ways that people approach a jigsaw puzzle? Hmm? Outside edges first. The straight edge pieces first. Okay? Somebody else have a different way? Corners. Corners. Find the corners. Corners. Do it by colors, common colors. What? Lay them all out, make sure they're all turned up right. Yeah. Yeah. And if you start putting pieces together before, if somebody starts doing that before you got all the colors out, it just drives you crazy, right? Yeah. No kidding. I've never heard of anybody that does a, a puzzle line by line. That's interesting. It's like people that eat corn on the cob a certain way, right? You know? Uh, yes? Yeah. 
puts jigsaw puzzles together upside down? Interesting. Oh, I'm, turn the picture down and work the cardboard side. Wow. That's a smart person right there. So you don't have colors to go by or anything. It's, it's all brown. It's all the same color. That sounds maddening to me. Yeah. Yeah, you would find me banging my head in the corner as much as I love jigsaw puzzles. But, but here's the deal. We all approach life kind of like we approach puzzles. I mean, life is full of all these pieces, right? Which brings us to this, the problem with life. Life is a puzzle, the puzzle of life, but what's the problem? I mean, we all want a full life, right? And, and Jesus says he wants us to have a full life, and it seems like there's all these pieces that we need to deal with, so what's the problem? Why can't we have the full life we want? Why can't we have the full life that Jesus wants? What do you think keeps us from having that full and meaningful life? Hmm? Greed. 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 Ourself. Focus on ourself. Greed. Sin. Someone else. I feel like I'm always losing pieces. Always losing pieces. Yeah. I, I, uh. Visited, my, I, I think I told this story in the last family conversation. I visited my mom a while back as she lives in an independent l- nursing home here in town, independent living facility, and, uh, or assisted living facility. Anyway, I visited her, and she was in the dining hall working on a, on a jigsaw puzzle. And so I sat down, and we started doing puzzle together. And she looked at me, and she said, you remember what you kids used to do when you were little? And I said, no, I can barely remember yesterday. What did we do when we were little? She said, you used to, one of you guys, and I had two other brothers, one of you guys would take one piece and put it in your pocket. <laughs> and, and so you could be the one who put the last piece in place. Yeah. And it would drive her crazy because she would be missing pieces. And if you really wanted to drive her crazy, you grabbed more than one. You kept a few, you know. Yeah, it always feels like I can't find the right pieces. Someone else. Hmm? Not focus, having just not being able to focus. Sometimes that means being overwhelmed with all the pieces. Someone else, what keeps us from living this full and meaningful life that we say we want? Is the we have expectations of how things are supposed to be, which probably are the things that get me the most in trouble in life and in marriage. Expectations. Because they're never right, it seems like. Someone else? Taking on too much responsibility. Taking on too much responsibility keeps us from having a full life. Man, that fits into what we talked about. Remember when we talked about margins in here? That's why margins are so important. If you haven't heard, if you didn't hear the last family conversations on the three things that every family needs or three things that everyone needs, go back and listen to those. We talked about meaning. We talked about margin. Someone else, somebody in the back. Distractions. Distractions. Yes. Yeah. Distractions, yeah. How many of you would say, I may have not been diagnosed, but I feel like I'm a little ADHD. Yeah, me too, me too. My kids are ADHD off the charts, and they say it's a hereditary, and I, it's probably my fault. Uh, What about it, the idea that it's all about you? Yeah, it's hard to have a full and meaningful life if it's all about you. Exactly. If life is, and it's a big if, but if life is a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, and we have all these pieces, and, and we have trouble, the problem with life is we can't seem to find the abundant life we need, here are some reasons The problem with life, first reason, we focus on too many pieces. We get distracted. We get overwhelmed. There seems like too many things that we have to do, too many things that are supposed to be done. Uh, You know, if you're going to be a good person, if you're going to be a good Christian, if you're going to be a good parent, everybody's writing books or blog posts, and they'll give you a list of things that you have to do. And most of us can't focus more on more than three things. If, if, 
if you're a female, you can focus on several things at one time. If you're male, two, three if you're really good, you know. Uh, yeah, there's an old book out there called uh, Men, are like wa- uh, Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. It's a great book. And, and it basically says women are like spaghetti. The things, they, it, it's all tied together. It all tangled up and everything fits and everything's connected. But men are like waffles and we have these boxes in our life and work goes in the work box and play goes in the play box and marriage goes in the marriage box and we can only deal with one or two boxes at a time. And uh, if it's a box we don't feel like we're really good in, we kind of avoid that box. And so, I don't know how I got off on that, but it's the idea that being overwhelmed by too many pieces. Okay? So, you can focus on too many pieces. You can get overwhelmed. In Jesus' day, they took the Mosaic Law, which was how many? Ten. Ten commandments. And they added to it and added to it and added to it until there were over 600 laws in Jesus' time. 600 laws that they had to follow daily. Too many pieces. You're not going to get all those pieces. So if you focus on too many pieces, you're going to drop something. You're not going to do well in something, and you'll fail to have the full and abundant life. Listen to this passage from Jesus. Teacher, somebody comes up to Jesus and says, what's the greatest commandment, the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first, the great and the first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, listen to what he says on this last one. Remember, I told you, in Jesus' day, there were over 600 commandments. Jesus said, the law, all the law, on these two commandments, on these two commandments, all the law and prophets hang. Over 600 laws, and people were wore out with them. And so, this guy wants to know, well, okay, if I'm going to have to do these, at least what's the most important one I need to start with? He said, there's just two. That's somebody that paired 600 plus down to two. So when you focus, try to focus on too many pieces, you will not have a full life. You just can't. Here's another problem. Focusing on only one piece at a time. You know, it's kind of the opposite problem. Instead of getting overwhelmed by all the pieces, you get fixated on just one. We guys, we're bad about that because of what I told you. Men are like waffles, and we focus on certain things. And so if I'm in the work box, that seems like that's all I can focus on. And uh, my wife will go, why don't you call me during the day? I'm focused on work. I'm focused on the one thing. And, And when you focus on just one thing, you will not have a full and abundant life. Life is bigger than that. It was the Greeks, a little history lesson, the Greeks are the ones who taught us to compartmentalize things. The Hebrews were very holistic people. It all went together. It was all the same thing. You couldn't couldn't separate one thing from the other. And I think I've got it up here. Now may the God of peace himself, Paul said, sanctify you completely. Listen to what he says. May your whole spirit soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. That was one thing to the Hebrews. You were not a person without the spirit. You were not a person without the body. You were not a person without, you couldn't separate those. It was holistic. And so when you and I just try to focus on one thing, just one thing to make our life full, it won't be because there's more than just one thing we have to pay attention to. But that will get us in trouble. Another thing that causes problems with the full life We focus on the wrong pieces. We focus on the wrong pieces. Uh, My wife and I are as different as night and day. We are 180 degrees opposite. Uh, We've been married for going on 43 years. Don't know how we did it. It's a lot of patience on her part, and we both kept ourselves from smothering each other with a pillow while we sleep. But we are way, way different. And... When we are working on a project, I will guarantee you we focus on different things. And she's focusing on this, and I'm focusing on that, and we both think we're focusing on the wrong thing. But if you focus on the wrong piece, 
if you have blue sky on your puzzle and you have a piece of green and you're trying to make that fit and you're just, it's not going to work. So it's the same thing with the full life. You can lose the full life by focusing on the wrong thing, on the wrong piece. Uh, Listen to this passage from Proverbs. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is the way of death. You can be sincere and you can be sincerely wrong. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful about not focusing on too many pieces. You have to be careful about not focusing on just one piece. You have to be careful about not focusing on the wrong pieces. You have to be careful about not looking at the wrong picture. At the wrong picture. It's like you really want to mess somebody up. Take two puzzles, somebody that loves puzzles. Take two puzzles, switch the cover box. All right? So they've got one puzzle with the wrong picture on it. Uh, They may kill you when, when it's all said and done. But... Some people do that. They'll take the lid off. They'll put it up there so they can look at the picture, and they start trying to put that picture together. But they're looking at the wrong picture. Somebody said something about wrong expectations. We have the wrong expectations. We have the wrong picture of how this life is supposed to look. How many of you would say the way life looks for you now is exactly the same as you imagined it in your early 20s? Not a hand. Not a hand. I could not have imagined how life would have looked like. But if I had kept that picture in my early 20s, I would not have the full life because I'd be focusing on the wrong picture. Make sense? I had this picture that some of you know me. I'm, or I won't say I am. I used to be a bit of a musician. I started playing music in the bars when I was nine. And so my goal in life was I was going on the road. And I had some opportunities to do that. And every time it happened, something got in the way. I come to find out later it was God. God got in the way. Um, But if I had followed that picture, I would be worse off than I could have ever imagined. I'd have been focusing on the wrong picture. And the problem is our pictures don't, we don't get them fully developed. Remember the old Polaroids where you take a picture and then you take it out and you'd wave it and try to get it developed? That's kind of how life is. It develops little bit by little. You don't get the picture <laughs> until the story's done. Then you get the picture. So if you focus on your expectations, then God can't change your picture. What was it? Corey Ten Boone said, I've learned to hold things loosely in my hands because it hurts when God pries my fingers off of them. Man, I can attest to that. So, focusing on these things and, and especially focusing on the wrong picture will mess you up, will interfere with the full life. All right, I'm going to take a break. Talk to me. What are you thinking? What are you hearing? What are you not hearing that you need to hear? I'm just going to wait. (laughs) Yes. No, that's a good answer. Our focus should be on what the Lord has for us. The, The problem is we don't always know what that is. And that usually involves more than just one thing. And so now we're back to which pieces are we supposed to focus on? Well, I think it also holds a lot of weight. Weight? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of waiting. And uh, like you said, how many of you in here love? to wait and have patience. No one, none of us like that. We pray for it, and then we get mad when we have the opportunity to develop it. Yeah, it does take patience. Moses, think of the story of Moses. Moses wanted to free his people, 
And he did it by killing an Egyptian and hiding his body in the sand. Remember the story? He's one of Pharaoh's chosen. He's out walking in his royal regalia, and he sees an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew, and Moses decides he's going to take care of his people, and he kills the Egyptian and hides his body in the sand. How long did it take before Moses really got to do what he was called to do? Forty years. Forty years. Most of us complain because we haven't found our niche in life in our 30s. Well, by then, he was 80 years old before he did that. I mean, patience is key. And, and here's the thing about patience. God doesn't live on a timeline. If this is the beginning of time and this is the end of time, God like lives in all of it at the same time. Which is really mind-blowing and frustrating for us. He's got all the patience in the world. And, and we don't. And he's developing that in us. So, yeah, that's part of the problem with having a full life is having the patience to wait on it while it develops. Yes, ma'am. Ah, happiness is not getting what you want, but it's wanting what you get. Well, that's a good one. I hadn't heard that in a long time. Yeah, that, that's some of it. Yeah, that's absolutely some of it. Now, we have to be careful, and, and I'm a counselor, so I, I really always want to preface some things. Uh, I have people that come into my office who are being abused by a spouse, and uh, that's unacceptable. You can't want that. That may be what you're getting, but you've got to change that. So there's always some exceptions to the rule. But in general, in life, uh, life would be a whole lot better if we could figure out at least, maybe not want what we get, but at least figure out what to do with what we get. You know? Someone else? Yeah. What about when you don't get it? And doesn't it drive you crazy when God doesn't come through with something you want and somebody looks at you and says, well, he must know that it's not best for you. Isn't that the last thing in the world you want to hear? Yeah. You know, he has something better for you. Well, where is it? And now we're back to the patience again. Yes. I, I, I think that if we serve a God who is as sovereign and who is as unimaginable as we believe he is, we sure want to put him in a box a lot. And, and my finite mind has a way of thinking how things should be. And it just doesn't work out that way. My wife and I went to seminary. We had a second grader and a kindergartner. We had no jobs when we went, which seemed very foolish to our family and made me question a little bit myself. Uh, and, and so we got there, and, and it's a time in my life where, you've heard me say this before, we were digging in the sofa for change to pay the insurance bills. You know, it was just a tough time. And yet, it was during that time that a daughter needed braces. And a wife needed braces. And a daughter had a severe asthma attack and almost died and wound up in ICU. And I could go on and on and on. None of that sounded feasible. It didn't even sound like a good God planning a good plan. I, I don't know how we came through it. We did. We did. But it wasn't our plan. It, that's not how a full life would have looked to me. And when we prayed for money... I mean, we got by, but UPS didn't deliver the cash I was asking for at all. So, yeah, you have this, this time when you, when you feel like you desperately need something and it doesn't come through. So the question is, can you still have a full life? Go back to the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul has a thorn in the side. We don't know what it is. There's been a lot of debate about what it is. We just know he didn't want it. He prays three times to God to remove it. Now, Paul's like Mr. Super Christian. If anybody should have, if, if God should have done this for anybody, it should have been him. And God said, nope, not doing it. And yet, this is the same guy who tells us 
in another passage of Scripture, I have learned to be content with whatever my circumstances are. Now, here's what I take comfort in. He said, I have learned to be content. Contentment wasn't just delivered to his doorstep. You know, UPS didn't say, hey, your contentment's here. He learned to be content. It takes, you have to learn to do that. And what teaches you to be content? Being discontented. It's a weird system. So sometimes when things that I feel like I absolutely need don't come through, I grouse, I complain, and then I say, let's see what happens. You know? Before I came to this church, I came to this church for an interview almost 27 years ago. I had never planned to come here. I was, had a, a hospice position in Fort Worth, Texas. I was the head chaplain in a hospice organization. I loved it. I loved what I did. And so I was content. And just when I got content, the phone rang and said, would you be interested in coming to Augusta, Georgia? And I said, where's Augusta, Georgia? <laughs> and they said, chairman of the committee, no less, you know the place where they play the masters. Honestly, I said this, what's the masters? <laughs> they should have just hung up there. Nope, we don't need this guy, this guy. But they were persistent. And so I came here and interviewed, and so I went back to Fort Worth, and, and I was praying one day. I, I walk and pray because if I sit still and pray, I go to sleep. Sorry. But I walk and pray really well. So I was walking around the campus praying. Here was my prayer. God, you know I want this. I want this a lot. If you decide this is not what I need, I'll go along with it, but I'm not going to be a happy camper. And it's going to take me a while to get over grousing about it. I was just honest. He knew it anyway. And so sometimes when we don't get what we think we need, it's okay to grieve it, be upset about it, ask about it. I mean, the biblical characters did. And then go, all right, let's see what happens. I have no idea where we were going from here. I just <laughs> completely got myself totally off track. Yeah, you were feeding back what you were hearing. Any other questions, comments, concerns, concerns about the speaker? All right, let's hit just a final piece. We've talked about the puzzle of life. We've talked about the problem being all these pieces and not knowing which pieces to focus on and, and focusing on the wrong one and focusing on too many, focusing on just, we've talked about all of that. And we've talked about how there is just, you've got to figure out which pieces to focus on, which pieces to let go. So let's talk about the pieces of life. Here's what I want you to hear. The key to a full and meaningful life is focusing on the right pieces. It's focusing on the right pieces. Not all of them, not the wrong ones. It's focusing on the right pieces. And I'm, my premise throughout the rest of this series, the next four weeks, my premise is, is there are four pieces that go into making a full life. Now, there's lots of things in these pieces, but there are four main pieces that you need to focus on at any age, any stage, if you want to have a full life. First one is this, no surprise, the spiritual piece. And we're going to talk about each one of these in the weeks to come. The spiritual piece. And there's lots of things we're going to go over, but this is foundational. You could skip this if you want, but everything else we talk about builds on this. It's kind of like the foundation, to, to use a biblical phrase, the cornerstone of everything. And, and if you don't build, any of you built like pyramids out of Legos or something else? 
The bottom is always the biggest, most substantial piece because it has to hold everything else on top of it. This is the most substantial piece because it holds everything else that comes. So it's the spiritual piece. Second piece, the internal piece. What goes on in you? Your thoughts, your emotions, your will. It's that kind of mechanism in you that makes you. That comes out of the spiritual piece. All right, and we'll talk about a lot of stuff in that one. That one's kind of right in my wheelhouse as a counselor, so we'll talk a lot about that stuff. The internal piece. Then, and, and these are in a particular order, the relational piece. The relational piece. The spiritual piece builds on your internal piece, and both of those build on the relational piece. Whether it's a relationship with a spouse, a relationship with friends, a relationship with coworkers, family, the relational piece. If you don't get that done well, your life will not feel full. It'll be frustrating. It just is. I know some people who have everything they could ever want, but relationally, they don't have it. And, and they haven't figured it out, and it's causing the rest of life to crumble for them because they don't do the relational piece well. And, and guys, I, I don't mean to beat up on us because I am one of us, but uh, we can suffer from this because we will focus on work and, and other things. We, guys tend to focus on the things we feel like we can be successful at, and relationships is not always one of those things we feel really good at. We feel outgunned when it comes to relationships. So we'll focus on everything else, but you will not have a full life that way. So... And then the last piece that we'll focus on is the material piece. Our stuff, our stewardship, uh, a lot of other things that go along with that. There's a lot of things that go in these pieces. These are the four pieces that I believe you have to focus on and get right if you want to have a full life. I believe Jesus talks a lot about all four of these pieces. So that's where we're going to be going in the rest of this series, these four pieces. We'll take them one at a time. We'll flesh them out. We'll dig into them. You got come with questions, ask questions. Questions do not bother me at all. Matter of fact, I had a professor one time in seminary said, a good teacher raises more questions than they answer. So you will find that I will raise questions in here that I don't have the answers to. That's okay. A full life is, what is it they say? The unexamined life is not worth living? That's what we're going to do. We're going to examine life in here. All right, any thoughts? I'm going to let you go just a few minutes early this evening. Any thoughts? Is this what you thought it would be? I didn't even know what to expect, so I don't know why you would know what to expect. Does this sound like something that's going to be helpful to you? Boy, you guys are used to being in church and not talking, aren't you? Well, I'll admit I came in here thinking I only had a few more years to live. No, seriously. You thought you only had a few more years to live when you came in here? My teaching's that bad? You keep coming back. That's a that's that seems problematic there, Norm. I think it was very convincing that there's still things to think about no matter how old you are. You know, most of the biblical characters that were used of God were used when they were much older. I mean, you have a Daniels, you know, but Moses, I mean, he spent forty years in Egypt and then forty years in the desert herding sheep and then another forty years in the wilderness. I mean, do the math. I, I'm going to say, I wish I knew where I was talking. I learned it from Todd now. I do this five years ago. Yeah, I. I, I, you know, I wish you knew that. Before. You wish you knew what we're talking about yeah. now five years ago. Exactly. Yeah. And I think every one of us could say something like that. I, I told you, I spent the first part of my life in bars. And there's been a lot of times since coming to Christ, I've thought, God, why did you let me waste so much of that life? But God wastes 
nothing. And his timing is always perfect. And so it took me, I didn't get saved till I was 22. I thought that was a waste. It was perfect timing. Right, I've right. I've learned, and, and I, I'm glad. Yeah, you take what you get right now. Live in the moment right now. Right. Yeah, because this is really the only moment we have. Where we get in trouble is when we, when we grieve over the past or we fret over the future. Exactly. And neither of those we can do anything about. So live in the moment. Because I'm telling you, the full life that we're talking about didn't happen back there and won't happen up there. It happens right now. Life's too short. Life is too short. And it happens right now. As a hospice chaplain, I sat with a lot of people as they took their last breath and stepped out into eternity. And I never heard one of them say, you know, I wish I had just worked a little more overtime. No one said that. You know what? I wished I had worked extra so I had more money in the bank. No, what I heard was, I wished I'd went to more ball games with my sons or my grandchildren. I wished I had taken my wife out more or listened to her more or whatever. What they're describing is, I missed the full life chasing a full life. You can actually miss the full life while you're chasing after the full life. It's very kind of mind-boggling, but we all do it. And the key is to not be deceived by that. The enemy only has really two tools to use against you. He can deceive you or he can distract you. That's it. I mean, we make him big and bad and powerful and he is formidable foe, but his only two tools are to distract you or deceive you. And when it comes to the full life, he uses both of those to keep us from having a full life. We get so distracted, we get so busy, we get deceived that this is it over here. And yet, Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. The word be still means to cease striving, quit scrambling, and know didn't say do, it said no. That is a good start for the full life that we want to talk about. Anybody else? <laughs> You're out there saying, I'm not saying anything because he's going to go off on a soapbox and we'll be here for another 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's pray and I'll get you out of here. Father, I'm grateful for this time. I'm grateful for the chance to, to sit down together and relax and talk about some stuff that that we all want, but we all kind of fumble at. And I don't think that's a surprise to you. And I think it just thrills your heart when we're seeking. So help us to seek throughout this series and to listen throughout this series and then to align throughout this series. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Bring somebody with you next time. Let them enjoy the punishment with you, and we'll see you next week.